It's been a dreadful last few days of economic news for millions of households, thanks to rising fuel bills. And next week, there's more misery as taxes go up, with much of the West trying to wean itself off Russian oil and gas, straining global supplies. Just how much worse could things get? Good morning to you with bigger utility bills already here and a national insurance rise due next week. I'll be asking the Transport Secretary Grant Shapps if he thinks the cost of living could get significantly worse. As Russia pulls back from some frontline positions in northern Ukraine, revealing how they've behaved in occupied areas, President Zelensky's spokesman will explain why he's warning the war is far from over. To talk about Labour's answer to the rising cost of living, the Shadow Business Secretary Jonathan Reynolds will be here. And the actor Eddie Marsden will be talking about his new drama based on the true story of the canoeist who staged his own death. All I ever wanted was a simple life. I'm going to fake my death. What could be simpler? Joining me to talk about the big stories of the week and look at this morning's papers, the Daily Mail columnist Sarah Vine and the Atlantic magazine's Helen Lewis. But first, the news with Chris Mason. Morning. Morning to you, Clive. Ukraine says its forces have regained control of the entire Kyiv region five weeks after Russia launched its invasion. But as Moscow's forces retreat, there is growing evidence of civilian killings. Reporters in the town of Butcher outside Kyiv have found at least 20 bodies strewn in the streets. Officials in the Ukrainian port of Odessa say it's been hit by missile strikes as Russia focuses assault on southern and eastern parts of the country. Eyewitnesses in the city have described seeing smoke and fires. Odessa has escaped largely unscathed during the conflict, but it's viewed as strategically important for Ukraine's ability to trade. The Conservative Party has suspended the MP David Warburton following claims about his conduct. Sources have told the BBC that three allegations of sexual harassment are being investigated. Mr Warburton, who represents Somerton and Froome in Somerset, has not responded to a BBC request for comment. Travellers are facing a weekend of delays and disruption at airports and on ferry services across the UK. Just as the Easter holidays get underway for many, motorists in Dover have reported delays of more than six hours, while queues at Manchester Airport caused some passengers to miss their flights. And in sport, England are finding the going tough in the Women's Cricket World Cup final. Australia punished the bowlers, setting a record target of 357 for England to chase. That is all for me. The next news here on BBC One is at one o'clock. Back to you, Clive. OK, Chris, thank you for that. Chris Mason there. We're going to have a look at some of the front pages now. Uh, we're going to start with the Sunday Times. Um, they're reporting allegations of sexual harassment against the uh, Conservative MP David Warburton. Uh, he's been suspended from the party and the uh, incidents uh, are being investigated. The paper has also uh, separate allegations about drug use and an undeclared loan. On to the mail on Sunday. Uh, the same story there, Tory MP in Sex and Cocaine Sting. Um, on to the front page of The Observer. Tories fear poll disaster over high taxes. We may get into a little bit of that with uh, Grant Shapps a little bit later on. Um, on to the uh, Sunday Express. Sees back stolen billions to cut tax. Again, for the Conservatives there. Um, on to the Sunday Telegraph. Uh, the PM's plan for seven nuclear power stations. Uh, we're expecting the government's energy strategy uh, to be published fairly shortly. And then uh, the Sunday Mirror there. Hypocrite Rob failed to stop baby P mum release. Um, Sarah and Helen are here. Helen, we're going to start with the Observer with you. Um, allegations there concerning the way that Russian forces have been behaving uh, in to areas that they've occupied uh, in northern Ukraine. They're pulling back now. They've been forced back and we're seeing the results of what their occupation has meant. 
Yeah, I think these reports have been really shocking. I mean, there was a report on Friday from Jeremy Bowen where they managed to track down the body of a man who had been seen on drone footage being yeah. shot um, while having his hands up and surrendering. And similar reports are now coming out from other areas around Kyiv. You know, the idea of people with their hands and feet bound who've been shot in the back of the head, for example. And this does pose an enormous challenge to the, the West and to NATO and, and the alliances. What kind of justice can the people who are left behind possibly expect while Vladimir Putin is, is still in power? But I think if, if the Russians do continue to withdraw or regroup, then we will be seeing more of this in the coming days. Yeah, I mean, Sarah, the point that Jeremy Bowen made in, the, in that piece on Friday was that civilians are accorded rights even in the middle of a war. Absolutely and, and it's not just I mean it's not just reports of torture and of booby trapping dead bodies there's also been lots of reports of gang rapes and you know attacks on very young girls and I mean just appalling mm. behavior. Mm. I mean I don't know whether it's to do with the fact that the Russian troops are so demoralized that they're just behaving in such a terrible way but but I mean you know this is none of this is all of this is provable we we have footage we have you know there's no question that serious war crimes are being committed here mm. well we know that the uh, the International Criminal Court already has opened a book on the situation in Ukraine so we may get a little bit more on that um, Sarah and um, the front page of the Telegraph Prime Minister's plan for seven nuclear power stations I know I think they're mini nuclear power stations little ones little tiny baby ones um, I I mean, obviously, the energy crisis is has become extremely acute, not just because prices are going up, but because there's going to be a shortage of it. Mm. So obviously, he has to have some kind of response. The difficulty is, is knowing what you can actually do in the short term to ease people's pain. I mean, I don't think it's I'm, I mean, I'm not an expert, but I think it takes a while to build a nuclear power station. And even if you want to put up wind farms and stuff, you've got to get there's lots of obstacles like planning permission and stuff, which he's going to have to cut corners with. I mean, I suppose, you know, he did. He was very successful in, in pushing through a fast program for the vaccine you know he was good at sort of riding over red tape to do that so maybe he'll take this approach which is just look we just need to get this done let's just do it but um, there will be pushback I'm sure um, I think in the meantime that we all have a sort of slight duty to try and turn off the lights a bit my teenagers particularly mm. I'm saying this on national television please turn off the lights um, <laughs> when you go to bed at night <laughs> and don't leave the freezer open uh, you know there's I think we've all got it's all happening in the vine household <laughs> isn't it we've all Clearly. got so used to I yeah. think you know we especially the younger generation I, I mean, I'm very old so I can remember three-day week in the 70s just about you know with, with you know no power cuts and stuff I mean that is quite hard I think that for me I've been thinking about I've been reading a lot about the 1970s and that is a decade marked by fears about inflation yeah. and that just in the yeah. time that I've been covering politics hasn't been you know actually anywhere really in the public discussion and now it is yeah. you know I think in this month I think not just with the energy price gap but lots of people perhaps you know their phone contracts yeah. coming up you know their mm. nursery fees are coming back up all of these things that have just crept up by inflation plus the little bit of headroom that companies are putting on because they think inflation is going to carry on going yeah. Yeah. And, and also of course cost of food I mean which yeah. is going through the roof I mean I was listening to the chief executive of Iceland the other day and he's just and he's just doing his best but I mean it is very difficult to keep the prices down mm. and this is going to lead on to our next story but I'm well there was an extraordinary story this morning about the fact that 75% of Britain's sunflower oil is process processed through one factory in Erith in Kent mm -hmm. and you know they've only got a couple of weeks mm -hmm. of it left so we're talking about now companies having to reformulate you know it's, actually, it's actually the most read story uh, the BBC, yeah. on the BBC I at think the we moment. found out that people love biscuits and I think <laughs> I applaud them for that but the, you know the, the, we're talking about having to change the, the kind of very basics of the food that we eat because of the, the fact that most of the sunflowers are coming from Ukraine mm -hmm. and Russia mm -hmm. and that they would now be planting yeah. next Season so yeah, so this is not a th something that's going to be a temporary thing. Next year, there's going to be no crops of exactly. any of this stuff, yeah. you know. Yeah. And maybe the year after, maybe the year after, because the Russians are covering everything in mines. I mean, who knows how long it's going to take for that country mm. to get and It's important to food. remember that the World Food, Food Programme actually gets the majority of its supplies to distribute through the developing world from Ukraine and Russia. So one has to worry about that. Um, we're going to go on to um, the story on the front page of The Sun there. Um, it involves the Conservative MP, David Warburton, um, suspended from the party. There's an investigation being conducted by the Independent Complaints and Grievance Scheme, uh, the body set up by, the par by Parliament three years ago to make it easier for staff to complain about allegations of harassment. 
Yeah, that was set up in the wake of a, a whole spate of Me Too allegations, and it yeah. was decided really that it was impossible for MPs to keep investigating themselves. So there is now an independent expert panel. And, and he denies all the allegations. We've got to these make are that allegations clear. that he's entitled to due process. But yeah. the interesting thing is that the way that investigation will now happen is, yeah. is different to how it was five, ten years ago. And it was the independent panel that recommended John Burko, for example, be be censured in the way he was over those bullying claims, which it found mm. to be proven. One of the things I find most interesting about this is that he was elected in 2015 for the first time, which means that he employs his wife in his office. She's in charge of HR. Now, if he had been elected in 2017 or after, you are no longer allowed to employ family members. And that is, you know, two of these complainants worked in his office and they were expected to take their complaints to the boss's wife. And that's symptomatic of me of the way that we've now had to try and start to professionalise mm. Parliament and make it function more like a normal workplace. Mm. Yeah, I, yeah. Mean, he, he, I mean, he says that he's responded, uh, he's not responded to the BBC, but he's responded to the Telegraph and he said that he has an enormous amount of defence. And he's... Well, he's let's see it. I mean, let's, I mean, let's see it. Let's see it. I mean, I, I think it's, you know... It's very difficult. People have, people have crises in their life. I mean, he's mm. lost eight stone. I mean, I, I can't help feeling that this is a bit of a sort of midlife... Maybe it's a bit of a midlife crisis. Not all, or not crisis. I mean, losing eight stone is a good thing. But maybe it's just, you know, he's, he's had a juncture in his life. But the trouble with being an MP mm. is that you are in public office and therefore if you do things like this, it has to be scrutinised. Um, I mean, I, 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 I feel sorry for him. It, it must be awful. But and I, I think that's the other half of the complainant you know, process, isn't it? Yeah. It's the fact yeah. that actually MPs often will say they feel very unsupported. It can be a yeah. very lonely job. Mm. It is. And I think it would help, you know, both sides of this equation if there was actually more support there. All yes, right, I mean, okay. I do think the House of Commons should be formalised in, in its sort of HR. Yeah. You know, having your wife working for you is not, is not ideal. OK, well, the allegations are being investigated. Let's go to the front page of the uh, Sunday Times there. Um, uh, actually, it's page 10 and 11, the shipment party gate story. Well, so the first tranche of uh, fixed penalty notices have gone out for the Downing Street parties and there is already a little bit of disquiet about who's getting named and who's getting not named. So we know the names of the person, for example, who's leaving party instigated this first round of complaints. And Dominic Cummings, who has appointed himself the nemesis of the Prime Minister, is very angry about this. I think other people are too, saying, you know, it's not really fair for deputy heads to roll. All these junior people yeah. are being named, but actually really this is about a culture that was set at the top. And are we going to hear more about the really senior people? Those are the people perhaps who should be facing consequences. Rather than a junior employee who might have felt, you know, in the same we're talking about, you know, pressurization at work, who might have felt pressured to go along to mm. something when everybody Or just a young did. person who probably didn't think it through. You know, I think you know a lot of people working in that environment are very young. They're sort of in their early twenties. I think ultimately the only way you're really going to draw a line under this is if you're just completely transparent and honest about it. Just be, just say, look, this is the, these are the people who've been fined. This is what's happened. We're really sorry about it. It was a terrible misjudgment and a huge mistake. Um, you know, we're sorry. We've done our, we've paid our fines. You know, we'll take responsibility and move on. But what, but what about Labour's suggestion that you know, if 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 Carrie has been found uh, to have. Yeah, I received one of these one of these notices uh, and has been fined that that should be made public do you think that's the case I, th I think it would be better I mean to be perfectly honest if it was me I would just she's be not a politician she's not a minister no, but she lives in number 10 and you know do you agree with Labour on this she, she, she sort of you know that's I, it's part of the whole thing I just think it's better for them to just be honest about it I really do, because otherwise I think, because I think this is really going to come up on the doorsteps a lot, and I think it's just if you co you can't be seen to be dodging questions, you've just got to be honest and say yes, it was a terrible, I'm I'm sorry, I messed up, end of. I think it has, although the I think acute threat to Boris Johnson's position has gone away. Mm. I think it has fed into a wider discontent, which will come out during the cost of living discussion throughout the rest of the year, which is the kind of I'm not being able to have a pint at the weekend, but you had a suitcase of booze. I, think I mean, that's I the think kind Labour are asking to, to, you know, they want Carrie to be named for, for for very malicious reasons because that's how Labour operate, obviously, because they're the opposition. But I think from her own point of view, if it was me in that position, I would just want to be honest and say, yes, I made a mistake. I'm really sorry. I've paid the fine. All right. OK. Uh, finally, um, I don't know if I passed this test. I haven't looked at it properly yet. <laughs> I love Page 22 of the Telegraph. Would you pass the BBC's class test, Sarah? It's the poshometer. Yes. The poshometer. So yes. the BBC have, have, have said very nobly that they want to employ, I think it's 25% of people from... Um, low, I don't know what to say anymore. Do you say... Lower socioeconomic background, okay, I think, you. is the accepted jargon. That's accepted. Thank you. I, I, 
bound to get it wrong. <laughs> I don't know. But it's very funny. The Telegraph have done it very well, and they've got three of their writers, um, you know, basically scrutinising their own poshness or lack of. Uh, there's not a lot of lack of poshness, I have to say. I mean, one of the things is, what, what, what were your parents doing when you were 14? Mm. I, I think my parents were mostly drunk. <laughs> But <laughs> that's probably quite a rude thing to say. What were your parents doing? My parents were um, a teacher and a, and a factory manager, but I think it's really hard. I think you qualify then. No, I don't, because I went to private school, and I think this is what's interesting about the way we talk about class now. My yeah. grandfather was a coal miner, and I went to private school. That is a story of social mobility across the 20th century. Mm. But it does make these conversations harder than they would have been 50 years ago. I mean, it's ago. just very hard to classify people along those lines, isn't it? Because individuals... Do you have an arger? No, there we I do go. not have an Arga. <laughs> At least you're not. Oh, that's, I think that's. Oh, do you have an Arga? No, I live in London. No, I love an Arga. Be honest, I would love an Arga. A nice, coloured, brightly coloured one, but no. All I right. Have an Arga. Okay. Have an Arga? I do not have an Arga. And I am being particularly accurate in that representation. Thank you, Helen and Sarah. Thanks for that. Now, certainly been a cold start to April so far. Let's find out if things are going to warm up. I sincerely hope so. Thomas Schaffernacker has the details. Hi there, Thomas. Clive, hi. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly going to warm up over the next uh, few days, but um, very, very chilly indeed. In fact, um, let's have a look at the temperatures uh, over the last 24 hours or so. And in Sennybridge, it was actually minus 7 degrees Celsius, which is the lowest April night temperature for around nine years and even in central London it was below, well below freezing. So here's the outlook then for the next uh, 24 hours or so. Uh, bright today but then tomorrow we're expecting some rain. In fact the rain is already going to reach parts of northern and central Scotland as well as the uh, east of Northern Ireland but across England and Wales it's going to be a mixture of sunny spells and also a few showers, 10 degrees today. And then tonight, the weather fronts move across the UK. You can see outbreaks of rain spreading right across the country. Um, a very mild night, temperatures five degrees in London, eight degrees in Glasgow, at least very mild compared to what we just had. And then tomorrow, it's a cloudy picture right across the country. Outbreaks of rain almost at any time, perhaps a few glimmers of sunshine around the eastern coasts, maybe central southern England too. And take a look at the temperatures, 15 degrees in London, 12 degrees in Glasgow and the following days will be unsettled and staying relatively mild. Clive, it's back to you. Thomas, thank you for that. Thomas Schaffernacker there. Now, President Zelensky of Ukraine has said Russian forces are withdrawing slowly but noticeably from around the capital Kyiv and the northern city of Chernihiv. But he and his Western allies warn that Russia's renewed focus on seizing parts of the south and east of Ukraine means many more battles ahead and misery for civilians. Let's speak now to President Zelensky's spokesman, Sergei Nikiforov. Um, thank you for joining us. Can you tell us morning, about morning, what you found um, in places like Bucha and other areas that the Russians have actually retreated from? Oh, that's that's really hard hard to to describe what we have found in the. Uh, recently deoccupied de territories like Bucha, like Ostomel, like Irpen. Uh, um, these images are uh, really, they are, they are heartbreaking. We, we found uh, mass graves uh, filled with, with civilians. Uh, we found uh, people with their hands and with their legs tied, tied up, if it's, uh, do I say it correctly, tied up and was, was, was shots, was bullet holes at the back of their heads. So they were clearly, they were clearly civilians and they were executed. We found, um, half burned bodies as if somebody tried to hide their crimes but they actually they didn't have enough time to do it properly so these bodies are corpses are only half burned and that's the it's only the first uh, you know the first assessment of the situation i mean these 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 images are really horrible and right now our troops uh, actually the, the whole kiev region uh, uh, we say kiev oblast right kiev region yeah. is uh, deoccupied is free from uh, Russian troops and uh, our militaries are now um, invest not investigating but uh, how to say cl clearing it up in uh, searching for mines searching for maybe some snipers or whatever can could the uh, Russian troops leave behind okay. themselves okay do you believe so, then what you found 
could amount to war crimes? It looks, it looks exactly, I'm not, you know, I have to be very careful with my words, wording, but it looks exactly like war crimes. I mean, uh, and we, and uh, I know that uh, Human Rights Watch is uh, is investigating, I don't know if they're in the field directly, but uh, they're investigating photos and some other video evidences. I know that uh, International Criminal Court is very dedicated to persuade all the war criminals, and uh, I hope that very soon their, their, their prosecutors will have access to You've seen some of these images, uh, and I'm assuming President Zelensky has seen some of these images as well. What has been his reaction? It's a human reaction. Mm. I mean, you don't have to be... The president's reaction is no different from... A, Sorry, a housekeeper reaction. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a common human reaction. It's a, it's shocking. It's, um, it, it is trying to understand why. Mm. Because I mean, clearly, some of the dead. I mean, what struck me the most is, the, is the dead person next to a bicycle. I mean, clearly, you're not riding a bicycle into to to attack you know russian troops um so it's just very hard to understand why is this happening is it's pure brutality there is no i mean military necessity to do all these I, that's that is the reaction and of course anger anger at the occupiers yeah, I mean, it, it must obviously be very, very difficult. I mean, is it clear that the Russians it are is, pulling yeah, back? It is, it is, it, sorry? Is it clear that the Russians are pulling back or are they simply regrouping, do you think? It's... They're pulling back in some regions, like Kiev Oblast. Like I said, the, the whole Kiev region is, is free from Russians now. And they are pulling back to Belarus to Russia, they are regrouping, and then they are uh, aimed to uh, strike at Donbas. That's true. They're amassing their forces. They're preparing to um, concentrate all their efforts, because <clears throat> before um, we had them coming into Ukraine from the north, from the east, and from the south. So they clearly failed to achieve any military, uh, how to say, a goal, right? At the north, they are having very troublesome uh, advance at the south, not even advance, they're stopped there in the south. So the only, um, the only region where they, uh, the only part of Ukraine where they having a, 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 some progress is, is, the, uh, is the east. So, and now they are concentrating all their efforts, so they're pulling from 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 north mm -hmm. in this case, and they're concentrating their efforts to strike at the east to encircle our uh, military uh, in Donbas. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of speculation that potentially there could be a meeting between President Zelensky and Vladimir Putin, possibly possibly in Turkey. Are, are you? aware of this and is this something that is on the cards um, the the only uh, the only ukrainian representatives uh, who can uh, comment on this is the president himself and uh, uh, the the part the negotiation group i know that uh, uh, there are the two negotiation groups from uh, Iranian side and from the Russian side, they met recently in Turkey, mm -hmm. as you know, and they are continuing to work together uh, online. I think they did it yesterday. I'm not sure about today. Mm -hmm. uh, they met online. Uh, and eventually, the, the outcome of their work should be a um, meeting between two presidents. But at this point, 
uh, I have nothing to say yet about it. Right, OK. But if you say the outcome hopefully will be a meeting between the two presidents at some stage, if that does not happen, if peace talks do not move to a point where you could get some kind of ceasefire, is your fear, is the fear of President Zelensky that there could be some kind of chemical or even a nuclear strike from the Russians? Um, I think um, there is a certain, I mean, it's, it, it, it is really worrying that Russians are speaking about uh, chemical weapon or biological weapon uh, being developed in Ukraine, which is clearly uh, it's absurd accusations. Like no mass, you know, mass murder weapon is developed in Ukraine. Uh, obviously, we're a peaceful nation. Uh, but the, the the very fact that Russia is is entering, you know, this topic, these these uh, conversations is is worrying. Uh, I don't know if uh, I mean uh, we we cannot foresee future, but uh, let's hope this never happens. Mm. Uh, but the very fact that they are talking about it is is somehow very boring. Indeed. Okay, we're going to leave it there, Mr. Nikiforov. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you, spokesman for thank you. President Zelensky. There. Now, later this month, a four-part drama based on the extraordinary story of John and Anne Darwin will be shown on ITV. John was the canoeist reported missing by his wife exactly 20 years ago. He had, in fact, faked his own death in order to claim life insurance and avoid imminent bankruptcy. Well, the series stars Eddie Marsden as John Darwin, and I'm going to be talking to Eddie in a moment. But first, here's a look at the thief, his wife and the canoe. All I ever wanted was a simple life. I'm going to fake my death. What could be simpler? I begged him to turn himself in. Where have you decided to live when it's all calmed down? Next bloody door! Genius! Hopes are fading in the search for John Darwin. We should never give up hope, should we, Mum? He'll be absolutely fine. Full English, please. It was all going to his plan. Gotcha! You want me to exploit people's genuine sympathy for your benefit? Well, obviously, don't put it like that. Yes. What could possibly go wrong? What the...? Could you tell me who I need to speak to about making a life insurance claim? Nice bit of facial hair there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's an amazing story, isn't it, Eddie? I mean, you've said that the story, if it weren't fact, you think it was unbelievable. What was it like getting into the mind of this character? The most, the most fascinating thing about John Darwin was that he was faced with bankruptcy, and because he had such a fragile ego, rather than just accept bankruptcy, he came up with this crazy idea of faking his own death. Mm. But there was nothing beyond that. He, he never thought of long-term consequences. He never thought of what it would do for his children, what it would do to his wife. It was just kind of a, an instinctive response to the idea of being humiliated. What's the most unbelievable bit of the story, do you think? What he did to his children, I right, think. Right. But he lived next That's door it. for four or five years. He listened to his sons grieve over his death, mm. to spend Christmases talking about him, and he was just next door listening the whole time. Yeah, you've suggested that it's also um, quite a divisive story yes. as well, um, and the dramatisation brings that out. Uh, what's the most divisive part of it, do you think? Well, the debate is, is about the, the, the culpability of Anne Darwin. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think w the, the drama gives a kind of sympathetic... Uh, narrative to her. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I personally have a, a lot of sympathy for her. I think she, she married him at a very young age. Um, she, very early on, their, their relationship dynamic was kind of set in stone. And when she was sentenced, uh, when she was sentenced, the law said that coercion, it, for, in order for coercion to be proven, somebody had to be in the room when there were coercion. Mm. Now, now they realise that that's not true, that coercion can be remote. It can be, you don't have to be in the room. So she wouldn't have been given such a harsh sentence now, I think. All right, OK. I mean, there is a subtle element to it as well. And the way that the uh, clips there, uh, they suggest that it's, you know, a sort of uh, a comic drama. 
But it's a tragedy as well, particularly as you say, the way that the children were treated. It is. The, 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 the great thing about this, this drama and the challenge is that it's funny and tragic and weird. I think uh, Richard Laxton, uh, the director, and Chris Lang, the writer, have done a brilliant job in finding that balance. Mm. And, and I think Monica Dolan, who I think is one of the great, greatest actors of our generation, I think she, she's amazing as Anne because the whole debate about the culpability of Anne mm. is, is expressed through Monica's performance. Okay. I mean, you've been on the BBC recently, of course, in the hit drama Ridley Road, a uh, series about the anti-fascist group in the 1980s. I think we've got a clip of that to play our viewers now. You know what that is? Yeah. That's a yeshiva. A school with Jewish boys. But there's no signs. No Hebrew, no Star of David, nothing. Because if there were, they wouldn't be able to deal with the death threats. It received rave reviews, mm -hmm. but you received a lot of abuse. I received some abuse, yeah. yeah. I mean, what, what happened was Sarah Soleimani, uh, uh, the writer, uh, she was a friend of mine, and she, mm. she said to me that we were both aware of the rise in anti-Semitism. Yeah. And she said that on social media is a perpetual argument because of its reductive nature. And she wanted to combat anti-Semitism with persuasion. Mm. And you do that with art through a novel or through a film. And so she, she, she wrote the... the the series of uh, Ridley Road, and what, what she brilliantly did was mm. she took the language of anti-Semitism from the 21st century and she placed it in the stories of the 60s. And if mm. you make a film about racists in the 1960s and you do it so ingeniously, you're going to provoke a reaction, and, that, and that's what happened. But I'm not Jewish, so yeah. I went on from playing a Jewish cab driver to playing John Darwin going off in my canoe. But my Jewish friends, they are Jewish, and they can't. They can't, they they can't, can't go away from it. Them. They yeah. get it all the time. Yeah. So um, th that, that's what happened. It's, it's, th there, were, there, were, there was a reaction to it. But the rise of anti-Semitism, my, my Jewish friends are going through it all the time. But you're an actor playing a part. Mm. But the assumption is possibly because you did play the role so brilliantly, potentially, that people put the two together. No, I don't think they knew. I, think, I don't think they thought I was Jewish. Yeah. It, the issue was... They just wanted to sound off. Yeah, well, the issue was... One, I remember one guy saying to me, why are the BBC making a film about this and not a film about the Israeli-Palestinian right. debate? And you say, well, because this is a film about British citizens in the 1960s mm. facing racism. It's got nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian debate. But they conflate the two. And, and in many ways, one justifies the abuse the anti-Semitic -Semit abuse. Yeah, all right. Well, it's good to see you, Eddie. Thank, Thank you so much for coming in and talking about your new ITV program on uh, a fascinating story. Many <laughs> thanks for that. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan came together in the shadow of the Cold War and nuclear Armageddon. And there's a new BBC series about their relationship beginning tonight. Thatcher and Reagan both believed that the West had to deal with the Soviets from a position of strength. This would require a massive expansion of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. Our deep ties and perceptions we share give us much to talk about. Together, we're confronting an extremely grave international situation. We do so with determination and optimism. That's Thatcher and Reagan, a very special relationship with her biographer, Charles Moore, starting on BBC Two tonight at 9 p.m. Now we're expecting the business secretary Kwasi Kwarteng to set out the government's energy security strategy to try to secure the UK's future energy supplies and bring down costs for households and industry. Well, Labour shadow business secretary Jonathan Reynolds is with me now. Thanks for coming in. It's good to see you. Um, businesses, they're not protected by the energy price cap, are they? And uh, they're facing a rise in energy costs of anything from 500 to 600 percent. You're talking about, wind, about a windfall tax dealing with this crisis. Is that really going to work, given that you've got so much more to spend the windfall tax on? Uh, 
Well, absolutely. It's nice to, to join you this morning, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I sit here this morning, Clive, and I, I feel angry at the scale of the crisis people in this country are facing and the lack of response from government in the spring statement and promises of things, announcements in future just won't cut it. We have set out that windfall tax that would uh, give households a huge amount of help relative to what the government are doing, up to £600 for households who are most affected by energy prices. But we put in that a contingency fund for businesses, a £600 million contingency contingency fund for businesses, which is necessary because all businesses are exposed to these higher energy prices. But for energy intensives, the situation is so extreme that some of them are even considering, you know, are they competitive? Can they continue production? And of course, when you add that to the national insurance rise that the government went ahead with in the spring statement, this is a really serious situation. The energy statement, by the way, will deal with, with long term issues of supply. I understand it. It will not be about help now. And the government has to understand the scale of that crisis. Okay, interesting. You talk about help now, the one off uh uh, tax, uh, windfall tax, that will deal with the issue to begin with. But what about longer term? Once you have, you've run out of that money, what happens to those but businesses? Are they on their own? An absolutely fair challenge. The long term strategy has to be a much better energy policy than we've had in this country for the last 12 years. So we've set out uh, on terms of what Labour's plans are, that big uh, climate investment pledge that Rachel Reeves made at Labour Party conference. We would spend that on things like, first of all, energy efficiency, because there's a massive amount that can be done to lower this country's demand for gas, which is the huge problem in terms of, of gas prices and the, the pressure on heating bills that people are facing. Mm. But also, yes, we would, for instance, not have that ban on onshore wind, which has cost the country some of the cheapest forms of electricity generation that are available. We'd continue the expansion of offshore wind. That's been a good story for the country. But we don't have enough of those good stories. And that's what, that's okay. what a real industrial policy should do. Okay. This government hasn't gotten Okay, you talk about a long-term energy policy. Um, it's going to take time to get that sorted out. Once you've run out of the windfall tax money, what happens to those businesses? Are they going to be on their own? Well, first of all, the windfall tax is about the here and now. The investment pledge is about the future. But of course, the situation that we, we've got at the minute, it, the, the windfall tax that we put forward, that we want to raise £1.2 billion with that to, to give households and businesses this help. To be frank, that would raise more money than we initially forecast because, frankly, prices have risen even beyond the, the extortionate levels they'd hit when we made that announcement. So we've got real support now and the long-term plan for the future. I simply say the government's got neither. So much uncertainty in the energy market at the moment. Russian supplies to Europe, they could be cut off. They could decide they're not going to have any more. As a result, that means that they're going to be competing for those uh, energy markets that we're competing for as well. The Germans, the Austrians, the Dutch, they're talking about plans to potentially ration oil and gas. Should we be preparing to do the same? We should be making those plans and the government should be preparing, not necessarily in public, for that situation. There's a lot of complacency in this country about the, the relative lower exposure to Russian gas that we have. But we should bear in mind, you know, part of the supply that comes to this country from, for instance, Norway or, or from uh, the liquefied natural gas that, that comes into the, the terminals in Wales, that is partly because Russian gas is, is fulfilling the demand so in you, central Europe. So you can see rationing of energy supplies well, in this country? I think what the country. government should announce is a plan which is not so simply shopping from one authoritarian regime to the next for fossil fuels with that long-term plan on renewables, on nuclear, on energy efficiency that would make the difference. But let's be clear, looking at the images coming out of Ukraine right now, okay. I don't think we should be talking about going back to business as usual where we just buy large quantities of fossil okay. fuels. So, I think we've got to be aware right. of what has gone on here and this is an incredibly serious event. Okay, so we, should be think so we should be thinking about rationing energy in the United Kingdom. Um, what about practical steps? The Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte, he's talked about uh, introducing car-free Sundays this month. Would Labour support something like that? An initiative? Well, I, I, I worry, th I, I don't want to dismiss other countries' plans, but I, I would worry that fundamentally those might not meet the, the scale of the challenge. What we could be announcing, what I wanted to see in the spring statement, not, uh, rationing should be an extreme That's option. Not enough, actually no, shutting no, down I, I, I think cars what, moving on a Sunday. Well, what we should be talking about is the steps, the policy steps. Only governments can, can, can meet the demand and the problems that, that, is, that the country is facing. We could have, for instance, had a, a statement from the Chancellor talking about how we will accelerate energy efficiency, how we will be uh, pre providing a, a real market so that people, more people can use non-fossil fuel-based heating. I mean, the, the, the market there just is 
isn't there. You've got to look as a government. Is the level of public investment sufficient to draw in that private investment to make the market? Is the regulatory regime sufficient? And on many, many aspects of that net zero transition, it just isn't there from the government. So initiatives and emergency plans, of course, they've got to be part of it. But the main thing is, has the government got fundamentally an energy plan for the here and now to address these problems? That's what I want to see from the government. Um, do you believe that if Carrie Johnson uh, is issued with a fine for um, parties during lockdown, um, do you think she should be named? Yes, I think anyone who's been in Downing Street should be named if they have been part of this. What, what the country Why? wants to know? What the country wants to know? She's not a politician. Well, she's not a minister. I she's think people want citizen. to know. All they want to know is some transparency as to what really went on in Downing Street. We were told in Parliament. Prime Minister told us in Parliament he was not aware of any parties. So it, what we've seen so far with the fixed uh, penalty notices that have come out to relatively junior civil servants, look, the culture here was set from the top. And all people want to know is, has the Prime Minister been truthful and has Bounding Street the as an institution the been following the same set, rules Exactly. You've, you, as everyone else? You've suggested the culture was set from the top. But junior officials... Carrie Johnson, a private citizen, why should they, their names be made public in relation to this? It wouldn't happen in any other walk of life if you're a private citizen. But I don't think being that the Prime Minister doesn't living in, in Downing Street is comparable to any other walk of life. And I think, again, because there's been so much uh, dishonesty, so much obfuscation from, from, the, from the people at the top in Downing Street, from the Prime Minister and his immediate circle downwards, I think people just want to know what really went on. Let's have some transparency. Let's have some honesty. You know, honesty and integrity matter in any job. They matter especially if you're the Prime Minister and you and your family and your operation are part of that. I think that's all the public want and that's entirely reasonable for them to expect that. OK. Jonathan Reynolds, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Now, Russian forces may have abandoned the retired Chernobyl nuclear plant this week, but they still have control of Europe's largest plant, that's Zaporizhia, in a city where yesterday there were reports of explosions and protesters being violently dispersed. Well, I asked Ukraine's energy minister, Herman Halushenko, if he was worried about the site. Uh, of course, yes. And, and uh, there are several uh, things uh, concerning Zaporizhia. First of all, is how they captured it. So, and um, they really sh uh, sh shell uh, it by tanks, by other heavy vehicles. And it was really very, very dangerous from the point of view of nuclear safety and, uh, and all. Now uh, they have their, uh, at the station, at the site, around um, from 300 to 500 soldiers who are at the station. Because that is really uh, a big threat, we see that uh, their presence here, it's really, really a very dangerous issue. There is fighting going on near the plant. How worried are you about the possibility of a nuclear accident? Uh, we, we got information that they already wounded some people there. And so, uh, uh, to, to be frank, they behave like, like, uh, uh, like mad guys. Can you confirm Russian troops have now left the site at Chernobyl? That's true. Uh, that's true. It, 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 today we already raised Ukrainian flag there. And uh, so this information is confirmed. They did it yesterday. Uh, and they, they left. But uh, uh, what uh, we know, I mean, from, uh, from uh, our information, we have the information that they uh, were now in uh, Gomin, which is in Belarus. In Belarus, and uh, now they in some clinics trying to get some uh, some uh, medicine, some health uh, due to what they are doing there in, in this zone. We really do not know exactly what they are doing, but probably they are digging the the soil there. They dig in, uh, and probably they get some kind of radiation there. I mean, is there a moral obligation, do you think, on the part of the UK and the EU to stop buying Russian oil and gas? Uh, I, I, I think yes, and that's even not not. Um, of course, it's it's of course it's moral now. But before that's what we uh, declare and we discuss in in all meetings uh, that in the situation when you depend on Russian dramatically uh, and uh, you have the uh, monopoly of Gazprom in Europe. You allowed them to build this uh, Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2. You want to increase this dependence. 
And when uh, uh, we only had that this is not a question of policy, this is a question of economy, it sounds ridiculous. And we said this, that this is dependence which allowed Russia to play their dirty game. The UK says it's ending its dependence on Russian gas by the end of the year, and the EU is phasing out its use of imports by two-thirds. Is that fast enough? Uh, I can say, of course, of course not. Of course, we, we want to do it, let's say, yesterday. But uh, we also understand the situation. What is very important now, uh, what we see, uh, that uh, even if EU or cannot decrease uh, or stop uh, the uh, stop buying Russian gas and oil, the most important things, where does Russia receive money now? right now because uh when they receive money so they just use this money to kill our people and 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 that is really incredible i mean in this situation at least freeze their money freeze their money but what would you say to those families in europe who are facing rising energy costs and who would have to pay more if their countries do end supplies coming from russia concerning the prices you know uh uh that's the price of, of your freedom. So uh, don't think that you would pay uh, less uh, or you pay, pay more, it would save you from Russian invasion. Don't think this. Mr. Haloshenko, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you, bye. Well, let's pick up on uh, some of those points now with the Transport Secretary Grant Chaps, who joins me. Good morning to you. Morning. Yeah, Herman Halashenko there saying that uh, high energy costs potentially in parts of Europe are the price of freedom. Do you agree with that? It is true that I think that freedom doesn't come free um, and that we're seeing the world's global energy prices respond. Although, um, actually, in the case of the UK, uh, we're not actually buying very much of our energy, hardly any gas and uh, no petrol and 18% uh, of our diesel. But that doesn't matter. The international price is affected nonetheless. Uh, and it does show that there's an enormous impact from what's going on in Ukraine. But I think if you don't stop Putin there, if Putin carries on, then um, things would be much worse still. Yeah, I mean, the situation in some of the uh, liberated areas in northern Ukraine seems to be appalling. Some of the pictures that are coming out um, does it look to you as if potentially war crimes have been committed? Well, I have been in touch with my opposite number, the infrastructure minister, uh, Alexandra Kobrikov, uh, Kobrikov, in the last, uh, well, throughout, but uh, most recently last night. Uh, he was talking about the pictures that are emerging. He's in Kiev himself, so he's speaking to people who are uh, coming to uh, see him who've uh, been first-hand witnesses. It's, I mean, it defies... You know, belief in Europe in the 21st century uh, that these sorts of acts could be uh, committed. I think it's incredibly important, even in these war-torn uh, times, that this is documented as far as possible, uh, because um, it, it's important that uh, we have the ability as a global community to follow up on this uh, afterwards. But uh, uh, the, the, the positive is that uh, Putin's forces are being pushed back in various different places and he was able to, Kubikov was able to confirm that to me. Uh, what we're seeing uh, as they fled uh, is quite horrendous. Yeah, I mean, you've acknowledged that uh, the energy situation is uh, problematic, even though we don't get a lot of our oil and gas from the Russians. Um, so that's going to cause problems for consumers. The Bank of England is talking about inflation getting higher this year. Energy bills are likely to rise when we see a review of the energy price cap in October. I mean, is it fair to say that the cost of living could actually get significantly worse than it already is? Well, I think we are clearly, um, you know, fighting what is a global um, pressure on prices. Um, having said that, um, we, we've seen something like £22 billion of support uh, come in for British families uh, from the Chancellor, uh, most recently last week, uh, announcing a number of additional uh, measures to try to keep the cap on this. Uh, and we get it. I mean, this is going to be difficult. We can't fix everything but we'll do whatever we can to, to ease the strains and that, that's that's been our approach and uh, how that uh, 22 billion of which 9 billion 9.1 billion has mm. been for 
uh, keeping energy prices down as far mm. as possible. Uh, although we're not in full control of that, as the global economy shows. OK, but you're talking about what you've done to deal with the problems that have just happened. I'm talking about the future and the situation potentially mm. getting worse. The prime minister has said in relation to the rising cost of living, as we go forward, we need to do more. What do you think he means by that? I think that's right. I mean, in the in the sort of long term and medium term, we've got this energy strategy. We're going to see that later uh, this week from the uh, prime minister. And we're going to look at, you know, we, we have, for example, an immense and invisible source of uh, national power uh, in our seas, which is the wind power. We, we produce more of it than any other country in the world. Uh, I think we could go a lot further um, still. I think we could look at nuclear, in particular, small nuclear reactors. I think we're going to see more of, uh, of that as well. And I think actually what Putin's done is a wake-up call to the West, because uh, we have been, as a Western world, over-reliant, although not Britain in particular, as it happens, but certainly Europe, Germany in particular, massively over-reliant okay. on uh, Russian hydrocarbons, and we are paying the price. But, but the Prime Minister wasn't talking about the energy strategy, and you're talking about the, the, the longer term there in relation to that. He was talking about as we go forward in the medium term. John Redwood, for instance, he says, let's hope talk of an emergency budget to tackle the cost of living crisis leads to action. Is he right? It's, yeah, I mean, actually, we, we've just literally had um, the spring statement, which is exactly that. It's but this is beyond that. This is going things... beyond that. He's actually talking about well, an, an emergency budget to go beyond the spring statement. Yeah. Well, I was, I was about to say it wouldn't have been the case if you were planning it six months ago uh, that you would have, that that, that uh, the, the chancellor would have uh, done the the huge numbers of things he. He, he did with you know things like the warm homes discount and uh, the cold weather payments, uh, en enabling, for example, national insurance to be uh, raised to the point where you don't pay any, where you don't pay your PAYE. So that's another 300, 350 pounds a year into people's um, pockets. These are measures that wouldn't have been taken, I think it's right to say, fair to say, if we weren't facing this cost of living energy crisis, and there are many, many others besides. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you count up the number of measures, uh, there are literally, well, probably a hundred different things that the government has done um, so far. Uh, and I don't rule out the fact that we may need to do more still. As I said before, we, okay. we can't fix everything. Sure. But we will do what we can okay. to ease these pressures. Okay, you make the point that uh, the government may have to look at things Further, the Resolution Foundation, it said, as a result of the spring statement, 1.3 million people, including half a million children, uh, are at risk of falling below the poverty line. I mean, is it the government's job to stop that happening? Well, absolutely. the government, of course, has a big role to play. There are always arguments about whether you're talking about absolute poverty or re relative poverty. This is absolute poverty. This is, this is absolute say, poverty we're talking about here. No distinction. I was going to say, the most important thing is to make sure you lift people out of poverty entirely. And I'll give you one measure, for example, that we've taken that means that somebody uh, who is working 16 hours a week uh, is going to be £1,600 better off uh, after the action we've taken, 1,600 a year better off after the action we've taken because we've changed the taper for the universal credit, for example. We've upped the national living uh, wage. So we, we are very proactively doing a whole bunch of things to try to, to, to assist. If you look at things like disability support, uh, we pay, we provide the highest level of disability support amount spent uh, per size of the economy in the G7, £64 billion pounds a year. These are not facts that most people will realise, but we mm. are trying to help the most uh, the people who are most badly impacted by these uh, by this cost of living but, change. But one, but one way you could actually help people is by cutting taxes. And uh, it does seem a bit odd that a Conservative government uh, isn't seemingly willing to do that. Surely that's a better way of getting growth going. Yeah, I look at it. First of all, um, that is to ignore the fact that we are literally about to raise uh, the national insurance threshold uh, so that you can earn all of your money up to £12,570, so twelve and a half grand, without paying any national insurance at all. That is, uh, that is uh, raising the tax uh, base, cutting taxes effectively, as you describe it. I think mm. it's also you know, fair to acknowledge that after but, okay, but... coronavirus... I was just going to say, I think it's only fair to acknowledge after coronavirus, okay. people will not forgive us if we are not able to get on top of the NHS backlog. And people, I think, are willing 
to see their money used for that. And that's specifically uh, what the uh, the national insurance but market you're, is getting. Exactly. You're saying you're, you're cutting taxes. The Resolution Foundation says after the spring statement, seven out of eight workers will pay more in income tax and national insurance by the end of this parliament. So, so uh, if you take, for example, uh, the national insurance threshold from July, which is that amount, which is going to provide actually £330 more a year, that's raising that figure. That means 70% of workers be better off uh, even after the health and social care levy. So that's the increase in tax uh, that's going to pay to get rid of the NHS backlog and actually sort out a long-term problem, which is long-term care, which no government's actually ever managed to tackle. And we finally are. The 70 uh, percent will be people will be better off taking into account that that rise in national insurance so you can earn over twelve and a half thousand without paying any tax. So actually, overall, we are trying to do this so there's people who are at least well off who benefit the most. And we accept that there are costs involved mm. in rescuing the NHS from from the backlogs. Yeah, well, we've talked about disruption in the global energy markets, the Poles, the French, the Germans. They're beginning a process process looking at rationing energy. And we've just heard Labour suggest that that might be a good idea to look at those kinds of proposals. Do you think it's a good idea? We should be looking at rationing energy. No. No, I don't. Um, I think the um, some in, in, in Europe, the Germans in particular, are very exposed to, to Russian uh, energy. Uh, they may get 40 or 50 percent of their... Can you absolutely uh, rule it out happening in the UK? I mean, as you say, oh, we, yeah. yes, we're, we're not as yes. uh, uh, open to shocks directly from Russia as a result of the fact that we don't get as much oil and gas from them as other countries. But... Those countries pulling out of Russia, they're going to be looking at other sources that we're competing for as well. So it's going to get harder. We've acknowledged that. So can you completely rule out rationing? Yes, I can. Um, it's not the route that we want to go down. I'll give you one very good example. We, we have more wind farms in this country than any other country in the world. The, the, you know, the Saudi Arabia of, of wind, as I've heard the prime minister describe it. And actually, this is an immense, invisible uh, national resource uh, that we can exploit uh, much more. I've been out to see these wind farms uh, in, the, in on the sea, and uh, they are, you know, incredible, sizable. The, the wind is generally much better out to sea than on shore, uh, and uh, we have plenty of coastline. So that's a very good prospect. We're able in this country, I think, to go further with things like nuclear power, some mm. modular nuclear reactors, I think, could be extremely helpful. Uh, but to answer your question, absolutely up front, no, we don't see rationing being part of our approach mm. to this, and nor should it be. All right. uh, but we do have to make sure we invest in, in energy, and that's yeah, what yeah, the yeah. Uh, strategy will do later this week. Sure. I mean, you're talking about Saudi, you know, we're the Saudi Arabia of wind. What about offshore, onshore wind farms? The Prime Minister's reported to be in favour of those. What are your thoughts? <laughs> Maybe places where it's uh, uh, appropriate, but by and large, well, so you agree. I think for you, you agree from, with that. You agree with that. No, well, I think uh, I was going to say the end of that sentence was by and large. I think uh, it's better to build uh, significant wind power offshore. I think that's where it um, it, it performs better uh, because it tends to be windier. Apart from anything else, you can buy it, you can build it at huge mass, much much bigger uh, than it could ever be uh, onshore. Um, so I think that's the that that's the sort of direction of travel when it comes to producing the large amounts. But there may be occasions onshore where uh, where, where, where where a certain amount of wind makes sense. But I, I don't think we want to sort of cover every inch of land in onshore. Wind farms, I don't think that'd be particularly uh, um, desirable. Yeah, I'm sure. Or the most sensible policy. Yeah, I'm sure the Prime Minister is not suggesting every inch of land, but he seems to want um, it suggested uh, wind farms on shore. Sure, does he know your opinions on this, that perhaps you disagree well, with him on this? If you don't mind, perhaps I have the, the conversation in a, in a week's time. I think I find <laughs> our opinions are, are very close, uh, closely aligned on this. Uh, would you have a nuclear power station in your constituency if that was possible? <laughs> Yes, I don't know if it's, it's possible, but I would say that um, the one thing that's always struck me about nuclear power, I don't have, a, my, my Hertfordshire constituency doesn't have a nuclear power station, and mm. I'd always rather assume that no one would ever want them. In fact, when I speak to my colleagues who have a history of having nuclear power, they are universally popular. They typically want the upgraded new one uh, because they provide incredible uh, very, very highly paid, very high tech uh, jobs, uh, you know, lots of science in, in, involved. Uh, and of course, when they're built to yeah. British standards are, are extremely safe as well. So they tend to be popular where they're there. I imagine unpopular before you build them. But, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I just wonder, um, how are you dealing with the cost of living crisis? Are you having to turn the thermostat down a little bit more? Lots of people are. 
Look, look I, I totally appreciate how much of a squeeze this is. I mean, you only have to sort of look at the, the, the cost of uh, fuel for the house, fuel for the car. It's very, very, it's very, very uh, clear that it's uh, that this is going to be very, very uh, tight. I don't want to underplay that in any way, shape or form. I said, I said, we can't fix everything, but we'll ease w whatever we whatever we can. All right. We'll leave it there. Transport Secretary Grant Sharps, many thanks. Well, that's it for today. Thanks to all my guests. Sophie will be back here next week. I hope you can join her then.